scale conservation, restoration of management in the Maine woods. All right. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, it's, it's, great, it's always great to be back in Burlington as a, as a UVM alum, as a field naturalist, class of 86. Uh, but I don't get that much chance to get back here so more. So we were invited to talk about some of the work that AMC is doing in Maine as part of your sort of newly expanded regional focus. Uh, so AMC, whether you may or may not know, is now a large forest landowner. It's something we have a 140-year history, and this is something that's, that's quite new for us. Uh, but what we, uh, what we call the Maine Woods Initiative is now 70,000 acres of land in the 100-mile wilderness region in Maine between Moosehead Lake, Greenville here, Baxter State Park, uh, acquired in three separate transactions between 2003-2015, but from uh, Plum Creek and International Paper, <coughs> heavily degraded, my term, heavily harvested industrial forest land, so basically a long-term restoration project. Uh, the man land is managed for combination of backcountry recreation, uh, timber management, biological conservation, uh, community community partnerships, uh, and it is part is the southern anchor of a fee-owned conservation corridor extending over 60 miles up to the northern tip of Jackson State Park, encompassing uh, with the new national monument over here almost half a million acres, uh, and with the surrounding. Uh, Easement lands, which don't show up very well, but we have the um, <coughs> Moosehead easement and the kind of forest easement up here. Almost 750,000 acres of contiguous conserved land. Uh, almost as big as the White Mountain National Forest. Now, uh, first talk about conservation in the region. And uh, talking about watersheds, again, this is a mountainous region. It's sort of the biggest Mountain, uh, mountain cluster between uh, sort of Bigelow and Katahdin. We have the Barren Chairback Range down here, the White Cap Range, uh, the Baker Little Bay Range up here. So there are a lot of headwater watersheds in this region. I want to talk about one in particular, which is the west branch of the Pleasant River. Uh, headwaters up here in the West Branch Ponds, flowing down through Gulf Vegas uh, and down eventually into the Nodstar. <coughs> That head, headwater watershed up, upstream of, of Gulf Vegas is about 32,000 acres. One of the state's premier native brook trout fisheries, very little, if any, history of stocking uh, in the falls in, in Gulf Vegas. Uh, essentially prevented the upstream movement of, uh, of introduced species. So it's as close to a wild, unaltered native brook trout population as you can find in the state. We also have Bicknell's thrush habitat at the uh, upper elevations of the Baker and White Cap. Uh, this is a TNC has identified this as a, a priority freshwater ecosystem for their regional uh, conservation portfolio. A retired Maine fisheries biologist called this, uh, this river system an ecological treasure trove because of the lack of uh, stocking and introduced species. And the Maine River Study called it one of Maine's top 10 undeveloped rivers. So it's a pretty special, uh, pretty special <coughs> river. Now, in 2003, before we got involved, about 11% of this 30,000 acre watershed was conserved uh, in the Appalachian Trail Corridor and a couple of small state, uh, state of Maine uh, properties. Now, 94% of the watershed is conserved. Uh, not only uh, primarily because of EMC's ownership, uh, but also some parts in the Plum Creek easement. Uh, and there was also some, some, an additional ongoing uh, conservation project uh, over there, uh, led by the Forest Society of Maine, that should bring the, the watershed level of conservation up to about 97%. So a tremendous level of, of conservation at the watershed scale. Uh, and also, about two thirds of this watershed is protected in Gap One or Two lands between the Appalachian Trail corridor and permanently designated ecological reserves uh, on AMC's land. <clears throat> now, one of the interesting things about this reserve area, uh, 
not sure how well this shows up, but again, this is Google Earth. This is a kind of a 3D image. This is the White Cap Range over here. This is the Baker Mountain Range over here. The, the West Range of the Cliff goes up this way. This is the sort of valley and river. When you think about big wilderness and uh, reserves in our region, most of them look like this. Okay, they're centered around a mountain system, and they may have some headwater uh, watersheds. Reserves that look like this, which are centered about a large valley of a major uh, major river, are, are relatively uncommon. You have places like the Pemi and the Wild River Wilderness and the White Mountains, certainly some big areas in the Adirondacks. Uh, but uh, this type of reserve is quite uncommon. Okay, so what have we been doing in this area? Again, we said this is some pretty heavily degraded, uh, heavily harvested industrial forest land. We have a lot of culverts that look like this. Uh, most of the major road systems in this area were put in in the 70s when it was back in St. Regis land. Uh, so we've been involved since 2011 in a major aquatic habitat connectivity project with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, Trout Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy, part of the larger Penobscot River watershed restoration effort. Uh, and over the past five years, uh, we've done 19, 19 barrier removal projects, primarily hanging culverts, reconnected 22 miles of headwater streams uh, to their main stem rivers. We've got another three years to go, uh, and we should have pretty much removed all the aquatic habitat barriers on this project. Most, most interesting is uh, this sub-watershed. Uh, this is the Mount Brook watershed. It's about a 3,000 acre watershed. Uh, entirely within our ecological reserve, and for 40 years it has been separated from the main stem of the West Branch. Uh, it is now reconnected. So, those old culverts now look like this. Uh, pretty good investment of public money, if you ask me. Uh, some other work we've done uh, is simply passive restoration. Uh, well, roads within these reserve areas have been retired and are being allowed to naturally regenerate. Uh, we've also, in, in one of our reserve areas, our easement allows us to do some active <coughs> restoration harvesting, an area that contains uh, hundreds of acres of sort of monoculture plantations, uh, red, primarily red pine and black spruce, and we were able to do some restoration harvesting in those, uh, not for long-term timber management, but try and restore native species uh, forest composition uh, and enhance the structural complexity of these uh, Plantations. So this one shows a, this is a 62 acre uh, red pine plantation in one of our reserves. And if you look at it up close, you can actually see the trees just planted, planted in rows. Uh, we removed half of it in sort of large, large patch cuts. Uh, we'll come back in 15 or 20 years, remove the other half, and then essentially this will become part of the reserve. Uh, basically, the natural regeneration will restore the native. Uh, forest species composition. <clears throat> in terms of forest management, uh, again, about, about half of the property is under active timber management. Uh, the rest is in permanent ecological reserves. So again, this is the West Branch uh, Reserve, but also the headwaters of the Roach River up here. Uh, a number of other uh, forest protection zones, uh, sort of late successional retention areas. Uh, we don't have a lot of late successional forests, but some that are, we do have some areas that haven't been harvested in about 100 years. Uh, so those uh, will remain as well in this area. Now we've been, this, this document, this Forest Service document, Forest Adaptation for Climate Change, came out uh, about after we'd been at managing these lands for about 10 years. So we were able to compare our management with, uh, with the goals set forth in this, the 10 strategies set forth in this document. Uh, and we've actually found it was a pretty good management. Uh, I mean, pretty good correlation. I'm not going to go through all the strategies, uh, uh, talking about what we're doing. A lot of it is what you might call ecological forestry 101, uh, structural complexity enhancement, restoration of more mature forests, strong riparian zone protection. Uh, I think our goals for timber management are very similar to what Bill was talking about in their structural complexity. Enhancement. We are trying to restore more structurally and compositionally complex uh, mature forest, even our, in our managed timber areas. 
Uh, we are not starting from nearly as nice a place as they started in their experimental forest. Again, very heavily harvested forest. Our approach is somewhat different. Uh, I think our, our long-term, our preferred sort of structural <coughs> approach is uh, deferred shelter wood, maintaining multiple age classes, but always maintaining that older age class. Uh, but a somewhat heavier harvesting uh, regime than a you know, group selection or a simple opening up the stand more. We do have a tremendous problem with the chels. So we're trying to, uh, trying to deal with that. <coughs> but again, trying to maintain, you know, restore or maintain more diverse, uh, structurally diverse and complex forests. Uh, biological stressors, we have an endangered species age, I guess. We have run three traditional sporting camps on the property, so we have posters and handouts. And, you know, our guests are kind of eyes and ears on the property, and so we try to make them aware of endangered species. Uh, <coughs> refugia, again, I think that we talked about refugia uh, at multiple scales. Uh, we have a large corridor extending up to Baxter. We have our ecological reserves. But I like to think about reserves or refugia as almost a fractal pattern. And at any scale you look at the landscape, there should be some part of it that's left alone. <coughs> so you have big reserves at the landscape scale. You know, at the sort of mid-level, you have older or late, you know, later successional stands that are retained. And even within a stand, there should be single tree reserves. You know, those trees that you know are going to live out their full lifespan and, and die and fall over. Uh, again, structural complexity, multiple forces is one. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of these things. Uh, community adjustment through species transitions. Uh, we're not doing a lot of active work in this regard, but one thing we do is we pretty much retain all white pond. We don't have a lot of white pine, but where we have it, we are keeping it as seed source. Uh, we anticipate this will be one of the species that will be favored in the future climate. Uh, so we're trying to uh, <clears throat> trying to enhance that component of, of our forest. Uh, monitoring. Okay. We don't do a lot of active, you know, monitoring of specific characteristics. Uh, most, you know, sort of our Basic long-term management is to our typical, uh, you know, every 10-year forest inventory. We also have a, a forest carbon offset project in one of our reserves that requires uh, similar type of monitoring. So we'll have a sense over the long term of how the you know, composition and the structure of the forest changes over both under both managed and natural conditions. Uh, but other than that, uh, different type of monitoring monitoring by our easement holders. Uh, most of the property is covered by multiple conservation easements and they all come out every year and take a look at what we're doing. Uh, we're also FSC certified, so we have annual FSC audits. Uh, this was a classic case of the uh, adaptive management circle that uh, the early speakers presented. You know, we, we have certain types of management. It gets monitored by our easement holders that tell us what we're better, we do it, we change our practices. Uh, and this is especially relevant because probably the biggest focus of these, these monitoring efforts are our compliance with BMPs, our erosion control measures. So we've made a number of changes in our, in sort of how we approach, uh, you know, road management and, and, and culvert installation and things like that. So again, very simple example of this uh, adaptive management circle. Uh, we are active, we are participants in the Forest Service's statewide spruce budworm monitoring. Uh, it may not be on people's radar screen, but it is a huge issue in Maine. Uh, becoming spruce bird budworm epidemic is pretty much front and center on every land manager's uh, radar over there. Uh, and we hope to be able to establish big nails thrush monitoring uh, in some form on, uh, on Baker Mountain. This is one of the, probably one of the most significant uh, pick nose thrush habitat areas in the region that has never been surveyed for thrush. I'm sure it's up there, it's on the right cap, uh, but one of the largest subalpine forests in the state. Uh, and we are in the process of establishing trail access to that area. So once that happens, we hope to get some pick nose thrush monitoring. 
uh, in my last 30 seconds, though it's not relevant to us, I do need to put in a plug for what we, the work we do on the White Mountain National Forest, which probably could be the subject of uh, an entire talk over here, maybe next year. Uh, and, and really, this is true, much more in line with what the Vermont National Cooperative Cooperative does, and hopefully we can get more involved in this, these types of activities that we can have. Monitoring mountain air quality, uh, sulfate deposition and ozone since the 80s. Uh, map alpine plant communities, not only in the White Mountains and in Baxter, but also at Baxter State Park is establishing a baseline uh, for climate change. Uh, we're involved in, in long-term uh, climate monitoring research in cooperation with the White Mountain Observatory. We've got a project going uh, on, on mountain stream chemistry, uh, and we've also been uh, establishing a uh, alpine plant phenology monitoring uh, project. Uh, we utilize a lot of citizen volunteers in a program we call Mountain Watch, uh, and again, which is essentially a citizen science uh, long-term mountain monitoring program. So maybe we can get uh, one of our other folks over here, Georgia Murray, who's most of this is her work. Next year. So, that's it. Questions? Everyone wants to run off the lunch. I'm curious about the um, culvert replacement work that you did. Did you folks look at um, wildlife usage as well as aquatic organism passage when those culverts and bridges were directly flowing? Wildlife passage, that's what you such as um, larger mammals being able to move easily along the river corridors under or through those. The larger mammals will have no problem walking through the same statement. They still have gravel forest and roads. This is not you know, major highways. So, so there, are, there, are no there, there are no impediments There are no impediments to large, at least not on our property. You know, when you get farther down the street, you go to civilization. It's not an issue on our this is this is a largely unfragmented, undeveloped landscape with no public roads. Yeah, so you mentioned a lot of ways that you have monitoring um, frameworks in place, and then you mentioned a lot of climate adaptation tactics you're using. I was wondering if you have any monitoring specifically to see if um, like your culverts will withstand the increased extreme events or your white pine are starting to expand, or anything that's specific to climate change adaptation strategies you're going to have? Well, you know, in terms of the white pine, we know it's regenerating well where we're retaining it. You know, when we do those 10 year inventories, it'll take, you know, quite a while to see if that is increasing as a component of the forest, which I suspect it will since we're not harvesting it and it's regenerating. Uh, in terms of the streams, I mean, we are designing. You know, when we replace culverts, we are designing them for larger stream events. You know, the only monitoring will be will they stand up when we get those, those big storm events. Uh, you know, that will be the, you know, the, the proof of the pudding, so to speak. So, but, you know, after every, when we have a major storm event over there, you know, our land manager will go out and you know, we will check all the roads and see what's held up and what hasn't. And you know, try to figure out what needs to be, uh, what needs to be strengthened. Yeah, a question on your uh, citizen science program. Um, what is, is their monitoring? Is it phenology? Um, yeah. So yeah. How, do go, how do they go about that? Um, we, they, we have certain uh, sort of fixed locations where we want to get observations during sort of uh, the, the, the season. And we have handouts on, I think we have three or four targeted alpine species, and it shows the different stages of flowering. You know, bud has broken, the bud is broken, and, you know, Flower is fully expanded, the seed is starting to form. You know, there's, I think there's five different stages. If people go out to that point, they record the date and they record what stage uh, what stage the plant is in. Uh, and I think we've also started doing it with some uh, some fall, you know, fall foliage changes as well. So yeah, there's a, just a well-developed handout. So I said go to this place and find that plant, and tell us what it looks like. Hey, uh, the club also has a forest watch program, so for non-alpine plants, lower elevation, Killian and others are in that program, and volunteers go out at specific dates annually and record what they observe, whether bud first as they describe, or flower, or pasture. Uh, one of the 
more and more, and then I guess it's smooth. 